We're beginning a new series both on the weekends and Wednesdays entitled Unshakable. And God wants us as believers in the challenges of life to be unshakable. Denise and I used to live in a mobile home. Now, we didn't have a big double wide like some of you might enjoy. Ours was a small. It was, it was 48 feet long. We had two bedrooms. One bedroom I could put a hand on one wall and touch the other wall. Many of you have walk-in closets bigger than our bedrooms that we used to have in that little motor, mobile home. Well, our washer and dryer was in the bathroom. And we had a wonderful thing. Denise was the first one to invent the jacuzzi because, you see, we could get in the bathtub, run it full of water. She would put a load of clothes in the washing machine. When it go in a spin cycle, the water in the bathtub would vibrate. We had our own jacuzzi right there. I mean, the whole house would begin to shake. When a storm would come and the wind was blowing, we'd hear the wind and the metal moving on the mobile home, and sometimes the house would just vibrate. That, that, was, that was the mobile home that we lived, a little old mobile home. Well, I want you to know, and I'm speaking prophetically, I'm not giving you a weather forecast. There's a storm coming. There's a storm coming. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is going to tell us that there is a, storm, a spiritual storm coming. There is a storm coming to this world, and God says that we need to be unshakable when that storm comes. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is asked a question by his disciples on the Mount of Olives. They're going to say, when is this thing going to be, and when is the signs of the coming of the Lord and the end of the world? Jesus <coughs> begins to answer that, and in Matthew chapter 24, we have the foundation, if you please, the template, the uh, of, of all biblical prophecy that Daniel and Revelation come and intersect. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is going to give us what I'm going to call prophetic signs of the coming storm. Prophetic signs of the coming storm. And I'm going to share with you today about three. In the app, there are five. I won't have time to touch on them all. In Revelation chapter number 6, we have the story of the seven seals opening. The four apocalyptic horse riders come. You go all the way down to verse number 12, and the Bible says, and when the sixth seal is open and the judgment comes upon the earth, the Bible uses language like this. There will be thunder, the earth will shake, there will be a great earthquake. He uses weather terminology to describe the impact of judgment. But Jesus is going to tell us there is a way that we can, that we can uh, inoculate ourselves against the coming storm and the coming judgment. And I want to share with you the insights from God's Word, the prophetic signs of the coming storm. How do you know we're getting to the end of the age and the end of the day? How do we know when the storm is about to strike? Jesus tells us, in Matthew chapter 24. The first one I want to share with you is that spiritual deception will be popularized. Spiritual deception in the last day will be popularized. Matthew 24, verse 4 and 5. Jesus answered, Watch that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. Verse 10 and 11. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and betray and hate each other. Many false prophets will appear and deceive many. In, two, in four verses, five times, Jesus mentions many. Hence what I'm saying. One of the signs of the coming storm is spiritual deception will be popularized. Many will fall into false teaching. And today in the American church... We're drinking a cocktail of one shot of New Ageism, two shots of pluralism, mixing it all together with egotism, and we've come out with a spirituality that is not grounded in the Bible. It's an existential experience, and it's all about making me feel better about who I am, not interrupting my life, a pluralism that says that spirituality should never offend anyone it should always appease and it should always validate the decisions we have already made. Today in America, there is such spiritual deception. There are 21 flavors of Jesus today. 
Get on the internet. There's somebody telling you Jesus is like this. Somebody else will tell you that Jesus is like this. Somebody else will tell you Jesus is like this. There's every, every shade of Jesus out there, and everybody has a take on it, and everybody has an opinion. Today, we have self-made doctrines ready to, to adjust to our lifestyle. We have decaffeinated convictions. That's convictions that won't keep you up at night. In other words, the gospel should be preached in our churches. And here's what pastors are being told today. Don't preach anything controversial. Stay away from anything like holiness, anything that challenges people's lifestyle. Make sure it's political, politically correct. Tell them about how good God is and God accepts everybody the way they are and we have so put grace out there to the point nobody has to change their lifestyle. God accepts everything we do and we just follow the Peter Pan of permissiveness into a never-never land that leads to nowhere. We are just following anything out there and spiritual deception has been popularized. It's a little before my time, but there was a day the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley, he would travel and fill up uh, venues and auditoriums because people wanted to hear the king of rock and roll sing. But people were so mesmerized by Elvis Presley, at the end of the concert, people were waiting for an encore. So to get people to leave the venue, an announcer would come out and say, Elvis has left the house. I wonder today, in the, in the popular, please everybody, pick and choose what verse you want to believe in theology today. If it couldn't be said of the American church, the Holy Spirit has left the house. I wonder today if we really have a sense of the conviction of God's Word and the Holy Spirit in our life. Have we watered down the gospel to the point that God wouldn't recognize it. That we have just so bought into a little bit of psychology, a little bit of new ageism, a little bit of feeling our good about ourselves, and we have adjusted our doctrines to fit our lifestyle. Jesus said one of the signs of the coming storm is, is when spiritual deception is popularized, everybody follows it and goes into that deception. Additionally, another sign of the coming storm is biblical truth is compromised. Not only is spiritual deception popularized, but biblical truth is compromised. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24, verse number 12, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. What does that mean? Let me explain. Let me unpack it. What does it mean, the love of most will grow cold? When Jesus says the love of most will grow cold, he is referencing a teaching he had early, earlier had given. It's recorded in Mark's gospel, chapter number 12. When somebody comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, I want to know what's the most important commandment. What is the, most, uh, the highest priority and the most important commandment in all of the teachings of God in Scripture, the Torah, the Old Testament? What, what's the most important teaching out there? And Jesus said, here it is. I can put all the teaching of Scripture into this. Love God, love others. Love God, love others. And Jesus picks up on that and he said, you'll know you're in the last day before the storm strikes because the love of God and the love of others has been compromised. It has been extinguished. In other words, biblical truth is compromised. What he's saying is to follow Scripture, to love God passionately, to love others. People are saying, no, you don't have to do that. No, we don't have to go by what God says. This is the 21st century. Everybody does what is right. Everybody does what's comfortable for them. And everybody just does what is convenient for them. And they have set aside the teaching of God's Word, the Bible. One of the signs of the coming storm is biblical truth is compromised. Biblical truth is compromised. This Bible, and I have a print Bible, it says Holy Bible. Isn't it interesting? You don't ever hear people say the Holy Bible anymore. This is 
the Holy Bible. God's teachings are holy. But not only is it H-O-L-Y, holy, we need to accept it holy. W-H-O-L-L-Y. It is the Holy Bible, and you need to take the whole Bible. All of God's word, all of God's principles, all of God's teachings apply to us today. And there are people that believe that God's commandments will take away their happiness. There's people saying, well, if it's really from God, it will please me, and it will make me successful, and it will make me happy in everything I do. And God is teaching us we need to follow his word, and we need to reassert that our belief and integrity in Scripture is uncompromising. Let me speak to the millennials just a moment. Millennials, in your study groups and your peer group, you know in the social discussion of justice and values and, 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 and social issues right now, if you bring up, I believe in the Bible, there's going to be a pushback. Some of your peer group is going to scoff at you. They're going to think that you're so antiquated, so old school. They're going to argue against you. They're going to tell you you can't believe the Bible. They're going to give you an example or two. They're going to tell you go to this website. You need to check out this. You need to see this guy's teaching on YouTube. And he shows you how the Bible doesn't apply today. And they'll give you all of these false doctrines where somebody has taken a Bible verse, twisted it, perverted it, changed it from what God originally intent, misrepresent it, and tell you you don't need to believe in the Bible. And I want to call the millennial generation. You are the salvation of this generation. The kingdom of God needs you. And in those moments, be bold enough to say, I believe the Bible. I stand with the Bible. I'm going to live by the teaching of God's Word. And when they scoff and they tell you a website or a YouTube video, you just tell them, this book tells me everything I need to know. I'll follow this book. I'll live by this book. I will do what Jesus says. I will follow the teachings of Scripture. Can I just admonish this? Let's get back to the Bible. Let's read the Bible daily. I'm surprised on how many believers do not own a Bible. Now, if, if you prefer an electronic Bible, that's fine. But my question, have you downloaded one? We have so many believers today, they don't own a Bible. They're not even a downloaded Bible. They Google a verse. They go on these free apps, and they'll just read a verse. But they don't have a Bible, either electronic or print, where they just read the Bible. They pick and choose. They Google this. They go over here and Google this, and they don't know what stands and what is spoken between here. We need to be where we read God's Word. When the storm hits, here's what the Bible says. Heaven and earth will pass away. His Word will not pass away. We need to live by this book. We need to embrace this book. We need to integrate this teaching into our life. Follow the Bible. And one of the signs of the coming storm is biblical truth is compromised. I will share with you, I have a firm belief. Every one of God's rules and regulations are put there to keep us from harm. God has not put one commandment in this book to rob your joy. God has not put one commandment in this book to take away your success and happiness. If God says it, it's to protect you. It's to put a safeguard in your life. It, it's, to make, it's to make you successful. And I want to say to parents, I want to say to young adults, I want to say to men, guys, get into the Bible. Get back to the Bible. Read God's Word. If somebody brought forth a false teaching, many of us would not recognize it because we don't know Scripture. I call this live and respect the integrity of God's Word. Additionally, another sign of the coming storm is moral social deterioration. Moral and social deterioration becomes normalized normalize. Look with me in Matthew chapter 24, verse 38. Jesus said, for the days before the flood, talking about Noah, people were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. What does that mean? Fair question. Here's what it means. 
The world had got so vile, wicked, and poisoned morally and socially that God said society was irretrievable. The only thing God could do was bring judgment that society and the world had chosen. They'd rejected repentance, rejected his, me- rejected his message. And the cup of God's judgment was brimming full and about to spill over in the tipping point. Up to the day Noah entered the ark. The ark was built and God said judgment is coming. And the day they entered the ark, people were going about business as normal. They were marrying and giving in marriage. They were eating and drinking. They were playing their video games. They were going about renting their videos. They were going about the normal course. So everything was, no- everything was normal up to the day Noah entered the ark. There was moral and social deterioration, and it was so corrupt, it was normalized, and people were saying, that's just the way it is, and you can't change it. And God said they didn't see the storm coming. They didn't see the storm of judgment coming because they had normalized it. In the Scripture, there is a deterioration that's very evident. There is lawlessness, wickedness, evil. What are they? Lawlessness is when people said, we don't need to follow the Bible. You know, the Bible says this, but that's for them. That's not for us today. You know, God kind of told me I don't have to obey all the commandments. God just told me, pick seven of the Ten Commandments and obey them. And, and I'm 70% correct. I mean, 70% in school, you get a passing grade, right? Sure. We don't have to follow. You just, most of it, and if you're sincere, that's all right. Lawlessness, we, we reject God's law, God's teaching. And we pass laws, things that are, that are morally and socially corrupt and inappropriate, biblically wrong. We pass laws and we approve it. God says the next step from lawlessness is wickedness. What is wickedness? Wickedness is when we begin to normalize the laws we passed. Wickedness is when you say, I'm not going to believe in that. I'm not going to follow. But, you know, I don't do the real bad stuff. I just do. Then all of a sudden, we, we've kind of moved to 50 shades of gray. It's no, longer, it's no longer light and darkness. We're in 50 shades of gray now. We're in an area of compromise. It's where in society, the laws we passed, we begin to live by them. And then all of a sudden, even in the church, cohabitation is all right. I mean, you pastor, everybody does it, 21st century. You need to quit telling people to live a pure life and just tell them to just practice safe sex because this is the area we're in and we need to just accept it. Then we begin to teach that God has a standard and say, no, we have an alternate lifestyle. And God accepts everybody whatever ever lifestyle they choose and whatever they feel like their gender identity is. And we, we move into wickedness because we pass the law. Lawlessness takes you to wickedness, but there's one more step in declension, and that is evil. What is evil? Evil is when you begin to celebrate the lawlessness and wickedness. That's when, when the Bible teaches something that God says he hates, you go on it and you like it on social media. It's when, law, it's when lawlessness and wickedness is lived out and you say, well, that's all right. We need to be accepting of that. We need to realize to each his own. Everybody decides for themselves. It's all right to do that. Evil is when we're celebrating the wickedness and lawlessness and we have so normalized it, we think that's just the way it is. We have lost the language of holiness and righteousness And we bring it all under the auspices. God accepts everything we do and any time we do it because grace covers everything. And we have so perverted grace, it gives us permission to live in opposition to God and God's word and God's character. Why? Because of moral and social degradation. Let me share with you the storm's coming. And here's God's word. If you won't hear him in the wind, you'll hear him in the whirlwind. God will speak to you and say you can escape the storm. But if we don't hear God in the wind, 
we're going to hear God in the whirlwind. There are people that you say today in your study group, in your peer group, they scoff at the things of God. There's going to be a day they're going to pray to God. They're going to like be beaten on this outside of that ark. Let me in. Let me in. I want God to change it. After broken marriages, after their life, their health, their, their, their careers, their fight, after sin has brought forth its destruction, and God's going to say, you should have heard me in the wind. Because now you're going to hear me in the whirlwind. You see, moral and social demise has become normalized in America. Example, in New York today, and th this ought to stir our conscience. In New York today, a counselor is against the law for a counselor to counsel, teach, or try to guide somebody back to their, their sexual identity aligning with how they were born. Whatever sexual identity they had at birth, it's now against the law in New York City for a counselor or a teacher, biblical teacher, etc., to bring them back in alignment with their identity. It is all right in New York if a counselor takes somebody and wants to get them to explore their sexual identity in an alternate lifestyle, that's all right, but to ever counsel them back to align with their gender identity at birth, it is against the law, and they face a fine and imprisonment today. In New York, in New York City today, the legislation is being considered in Rhode Island, and in Virginia, and just this past week, I listened to the governor of Virginia. The governor of Virginia on a radio interview said that the government ought to stay out of reproductive process and decisions completely. What does that mean? The words of the governor explained it like this. We want to make, it's already legal in New York, the state of New York. They're wanting to do it in Rhode Island and in Virginia where you can have an abortion up to the date of delivery of the baby in the ninth month, the third trimester, up to the day of delivery, you can still perform an abortion. A fully formed a baby in a womb can be destroyed and murdered. To the point of, the, the governor of Virginia described it like this. We need to stay out of it. That's a decision for parents. And he described a scenario where babies would be born alive. Parents would then decide whether to keep it. No medical attention is given to the baby until the parents decide whether to keep it. And if the parents say they don't want it, the baby would be allowed to die. It would be aborted after birth, if you please, murdered after birth. That is unconscionable. It's uncivilized, it's immoral, and it, it brings us to the point that every spirit-filled, Bible-believing believer ought to be offended by the day in which we live and what we have allowed in our society. My goodness, don't we have the ability to have a conscience today? That's where we're going. That's where we're at today. Why? Because... Social and moral deterioration has been normalized. And I'm here today to awaken our conscience. It's a sign of the coming storm. And Jesus said, you're going to know. You're going to know it's the last days. You're going to know the last days when, when spiritual deception is popularized. Biblical truth is compromised, and moral and social deterioration is normalized when it is the way the society lives. Jesus said, the storm is about to strike. But I have a word for every believer today. In Matthew chapter 24, verse number 13, here's the promise to every believer here. Jesus said, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Put that in your heart. The one that stands firm. What am I saying? Stand firm. What am I inviting you to do? Stand firm. What does that mean? I realize we, 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 we feel like we're, we're overwhelmed by the social and moral challenges today. You say, Pastor, I can't change everything. I agree with you. 
But in your circle, in your area, stand firm. Stand firm on your values. Stand firm in your beliefs. Young adults, when you're in your study groups and peer groups, put down your foot and say, I'm going to believe it. When you get a pushback from most, stand firm. Be the guiding light. Be the influence. Don't succumb to the peer pressure of the moment. Moreover, guys, I'm going to call every, every one of our guys to this. Guys, your peers at work, your friends, your buddies, you know what happens when there's not ladies around. You know the, the, the talk that goes on, the jokes, the innuendos, the sexual innuendos. You know when they see a pretty girl and they, they begin to take their language and undress her in conversation. I'm going to call every man to not participate. Don't laugh at those jokes. Don't participate. I'm going to call every believer at Westover. Every believer at Westover. Don't use F-bombs in your language. Don't use bathroom language to describe your mood and your attitude and your opinion on things. Our conversations, we ought to be separate from that. We ought to be above that. We ought to be above that. I call believers to walk different, live different, and follow God's teachings and be an example in every aspect of our life. I'm calling believers to stand firm. Here's what Jesus said. Stand firm and you'll be saved. Let me bring it down to this. In the Old Testament, we have the story of the walls of Jericho falling. The Bible says great was the collapse there, and there were people just destroyed in their homes. But all around the city of Jericho, the walls fell except for one little section. One little sliver of the wall did not fall and collapse because there was one lady living on that wall. Her name was Rahab. Rahab was a part of the people of Jericho until she heard about the God of, uh, the God of heaven and earth, Jehovah. And she says, I'm going to believe and I'm going to accept Jehovah as my Lord and my Redeemer. I'm going to give my allegiance to Jehovah. And when the wall collapsed, it collapsed everywhere but one sliver of wall where Rahab lived. And she and her household were protected. And I want to bring this word to you. Jesus said, those who stand firm to the end, they'll be saved. If you'll stand for God, God will stand with you. If you'll stand for God, God will stand with you. What does that mean? That means this. That means that we're going to have a different lifestyle. Denise and I were going to watch a movie the other day on Netflix, turned it on, and we were not just a few minutes in it, three F-bombs came out. And we just looked and said, we're done with this. Well, that's, that's not going to be in this home. Stand firm. Parents, parents, you have, you have kids at home. On their electronic device, they download music. If it has, if it has inappropriate language and F-bombs in it, I'm going to call. You need to know what they're listening to and set a standard. That's not going to happen. Parents, they eat at your table. They live under your roof. There's no debate. They're in the house of God. It doesn't matter. They're 16. If they're in your home, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's not a debate. I don't want to go to church anymore. That's all right. There's apartments all over San Antonio you can live in. But when you put your feet under our table, you live under this roof, this household, we have a stand, stand firm. And here's God's word to it. Your home will be protected. Parents, parents, don't go up to the school district and pound your fist on the desk of the vice president, the vice president, the, the, the vice principal and the principals. Go up there and be an advocate. I know educators that would love to hear support, not screaming and not anger, but godly parents to come up and voice their concerns. It gives the educators the strength to change and adjust policy in the, in the uh, school. We need to be salt and light. We can make a difference. Stand firm. Stand firm in your values. Stand firm in your beliefs. If a conversation gets out of hand and gets risque, guys, walk away from it. Just walk away from it. I'm calling everyone here to stand firm. And across this auditorium with heads bowed and eyes closed for just a moment, would you allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart? I just sense, I just sense God's Spirit in the house. Would you just take a private devotional moment with God? 
What is God speaking to you? Is there an area that you have compromised? Is there an area you've dismissed teaching from God's Word? Is there an area that you have not held up that value? Is there an area that you've succumbed to culture? And I believe there are people in this room. I'm calling you back to the God of your youth. You see, when you were a teenager and you were a kid, when you were raised in church, you were raised with values. You were raised with convictions. And what's happened? You've allowed culture to tell you you don't have to follow that. You've allowed culture to to talk you out of your convictions and you're doing stuff now you never dreamed you'd do you'd have done five years ago and ten years ago and I'm calling you back to the God of your youth there's a time you'd have never gone down and bought a six-pack and brought it home but you say now everybody does it I'm calling you back to the God of your youth I'm calling you back to stand firm in your values I'm calling you to stand firm in the teachings of Scripture and your, your allegiance to God and, and Scripture. I call you to serve the Lord. So in whatever area, in whatever arena that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, stand firm. Stand firm. Stand firm. God, right now, I believe the Holy Spirit is speaking to many hearts in the room and conviction is in the house. Some are being reminded of areas that they've compromised and they've normalized things that a few years ago they would have never dreamed of doing. But the Holy Spirit has pointed it out to them. And now they're making a fresh commitment to the Lord. They're making a commitment to the Word of God to follow God. I pray for them. I pray for parents today who are facing the headwind of culture in a way, God, it's, it is frightening what parents with young children and teenager they are having to face. I pray for them. If they'll stand firm, God, if they'll stand with you, you'll stand with them. I call Westover to an area of righteousness that we will hold a standard, that we will welcome the conviction of the Holy Spirit, that we will allow the Word of God to instruct and at times even rebuke us, self-included God. Let your Word examine my heart. I pray that. I pray, God, that we'll keep up our vigilance, our spiritual vigilance. I pray, God, we will not follow the trend of culture today and just accept any teaching because it's popular. But, oh, God, we will thirst after you and we'll thirst after righteousness. Awaken our convictions. Awaken our conscience. I pray for our men. God, I long to see men just stand up and stand strong I, I, lo I long to see men take that next step of spiritual growth and spiritual health and I pray that for them I pray they will join us here at Westover in their spiritual journey this year and they will become godly men for without, without men of God there will be no move of God I pray men's hearts will be will be stirred, their conscience will be stirred for their family and men will be faithful to the things of God and as we're about to go Lord I pray that what you've spoken to our heart will not quickly leave it won't be lost in the activities and, and the distractions and the duties and responsibilities through the week somehow God let this live within our spirit I call families, God, I call families back to the Bible to read and live and follow Scripture. I pray that, God. I pray that in your blessing upon him. In Jesus' name, amen.